where I can't acknowledge it. But I have no knowledge that he spoke to. But I'm telling you, I wasn't there then. So it's not significant because the well, version Michael he Cohen gave is, to the... But he's convicted of, uh, I mean, one of the things he pled guilty, pleaded guilty to, I believe, is lying to Congress about the Trump well, Tower time? deal. Which time, well, I'm talking, Jake? Uh, well, you can pick your time. Right, he, but about the, Trump Tower, deal, about the Trump Tower deal. About the Trump deal. But he's pleading guilty to get a reduced sentence, which means he's saying what the prosecutor wants him to say. But you just acknowledge that President Trump might have talked to him about, about his testimony. And so what if he talked well, to him about it? is it not possible it, that Michael it, Cohen had that conversation? And I'm just asking you for what, what happened or what didn't happen. It's not possible. That President not Michael possible. Cohen left the conversation thinking, well, this is what the boss wants me to say. The boss wants me not to say. Not possible. CNN's Sarah Westwood is at the White House for us. Sarah, during that interview, Giuliani also offered a very colorful idea of what he thinks qualifies as obstruction of justice. That's right, Anna, the president's personal attorney making the argument that simply removing a cabinet official, even one who might be involved in an investigation, is not itself obstruction of justice. Rudy Giuliani arguing that that would require an additional act of wrongdoing in order to become obstruction, or what would otherwise be a lawful exercise of the president's constitutional authority to fire someone in his cabinet. Now, this, of course, comes as the president is under renewed scrutiny of whether or not he may have committed obstruction during the course of the Russia investigation. Giuliani, as you just heard, uh, has been denying that President Trump instructed his former attorney, Michael Cohen, to lie to Congress. But he did leave open the possibility that Trump and Cohen may have talked about that testimony before Cohen delivered it. Now, Giuliani is also making the argument, though, that the president's repeated threats against Cohen's father-in-law is not obstruction, seemingly contradicting his own logic there. Trump has repeatedly called for an investigation into Cohen's father-in-law as there has been uh, scrutiny on Cohen. Take a listen to Giuliani's argument. The president of the United States today fires one of his cabinet members. He cannot be prosecuted for obstruction of justice. He would, have to, uh, he would have to do a corrupt act in addition to mm -hmm. that. He goes up to his cabinet member and says, if you uh, don't do this, I'm going to break your legs. Right. Or I'm going to take money away from you. Or I'm going to have your wife put under investigation. Well, uh, now we have obstruction of justice. Well, let me ask, the, the president is repeatedly calling publicly on Judge Janine's show, on Twitter. Uh, he's repeatedly calling for an investigation into Michael Cohen's father-in-law ahead of Michael Cohen's testimony before Congress. By your own definition, isn't that obstruction no, or attempting to yourself. intimidate a no, witness? No, Now, if you, if you made that obstruction, I can't defend anybody. Now, rewind a year and a half, the FBI did open an obstruction of, just, obstruction of justice inquiry into President Trump after he fired his former FBI director, James Comey. That was folded into Mueller's investigation, so we don't know the status of it, and we don't know, Anna, what Mueller knows about the discussions Trump may have had with his former lawyer, Cohen, about that testimony to Congress. That's right. We have a lot of questions still need to be answered. Sarah Westwood, thank you. This does move the ball forward. So let's talk about it with our CNN legal analyst, Paul Callen, and White House reporter for Bloomberg News, Tolu Olaranipa. Um, Paul, you heard Giuliani there making clear he's certain Trump didn't tell Cohen to lie, but he leaves open the possibility that Trump and Cohen may have discussed something about his testimony in Congress. If he knew Cohen lied to Congress, is that a problem? I think it is a problem because he uh, would have an obligation, you would think, as the chief law enforcement officer of the United States, which the president is, by the way, if he knew that his own personal lawyer had lied to Congress to do something to straighten things out. You would expect an honorable or an ethical person to do that. Now, the law doesn't require him to do that, so I suppose Giuliani may be technically correct that that's not uh, a crime. However, uh, when impeachment charges were lodged against Richard Nixon by the House Judiciary Committee, one of the things that was listed was uh, a failure to correct testimony, incorrect testimony that had been given in connection with the Watergate investigation. So there is some precedent for proceeding uh, in an impeachment proceeding on this. Now, Giuliani also says it's perfectly normal if the two had talked about Cohen's testimony. Is that normal? Well, he has a point in, in, in the sense that if you had, let's say it was just a regular corporate situation and a lawyer for the corporation was being called to testify uh, in a proceeding, yes, you could 
discuss with him the testimony. As a matter of fact, he might want to discuss it with you to, to refresh his recollection. What's illegal is steering his testimony, is saying to him, you know, it's really going to hurt me if you say that you were negotiating Trump Tower Moscow during the campaign. Now, that would be an attempt to influence the testimony and could be criminal. All right, so Tolu, here's the other thing. Giuliani also talked about that Trump Tower Moscow deal and apparently, according to Giuliani today, it could have lasted until November of 2016. Listen. Well, it's our understanding that, it, that they went on throughout 2016 more than a lot of them, but there were conversations. Can't be sure of the exact dates, but the president can remember having conversations with him about it. Throughout 2016. The president also remembered. Yeah, probably up to, could be up to as far as October, November. Our answers cover until the election. So anytime during that period, they could have talked about it. If these talks lasted into November, that means they were happening the entire time president was running for president. They were happening in July when he said his businesses weren't involved with Russia. They were happening in August when national security officials actually warned Trump that Russia could try to infiltrate his campaign. Tolu, when you look at this timeline, you can see why it would benefit Trump for the talks to end in January, like Cohen originally told Congress. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it would also include the time when Russia was uh, in interfering in the presidential election on Trump's behalf and to Trump's benefit uh, if he was in cahoots in a business deal at the same time that the Russians were hacking Hillary Clinton's emails and releasing them to the public, it would not look good to know that President Trump was having this, these secret, uh, un, undiscovered and unrevealed talks uh, with Russia about building the Trump Tower Moscow. So it does give us a sense of why and what the incentive might have been for Michael Cohen to decide to mislead Congress about the timeline. Uh, that definitely benefited President Trump at, at the time that he was still trying to say, you know, I have no dealings with Russia. I have not had any deals with Russia. I have not been involved in any business interests with Russia. Uh, so it does make sense that Michael Cohen was making uh, a statement that was misleading to Congress in a way that benefited President Trump. Uh, and that now we hear from uh, Giuliani that President Trump and Michael Cohen may have talked before Michael Cohen made these misleading statements. Uh, the pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together, and the last piece would be whether or not President Trump was aware or whether or not he directed Michael Cohen to steer uh, Congress away from knowing that President Trump was having these talks about um, Russia and, and, and the Trump Tower of Moscow before uh, the election, even up until the election actually happened. Right. So the timeline uh, that Michael Cohen put forward in, in misleading Congress was to Trump's benefit, and whether or not the president knew about that in advance or whether or not he directed that is the big question that we might have to wait until Mueller uh, wraps up his investigation before we all know that. Or I wonder if this is a question now that Cohen will face in that public testimony uh, just next month. Uh, Giuliani also made some headlines this week for saying he never claimed there was no collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. And that's significant because here he is moving the goalposts again on this issue. Listen. The collusion part we're pretty comfortable with because there has been none. No evidence of collusion. I am not even know if that's a crime, colluding about Russians. If the collusion happened, it happened a long time ago. I never said there was no collusion between the campaign or between people in the campaign. Yeah, I said the you, president of the United States. Paul, what do you make of just how much the goalposts have moved? Well, I, you know, it's bizarre with Giuliani because it's almost like he's put on the air by the Trump people to prove that nothing's illegal. I mean, it sound, when he starts out, he starts saying, well, collusion with the Russians would be a problem, but of course, the president and the campaign never did that. And now at the end of this road, he's saying, well, maybe collusion took place, but the president didn't know anything about it. Um, I find that hard to believe. If that's your defense, and if Mueller has something on collusion, uh, the president's in big trouble. Because when you sit back and think about it, is it possible that the amateur operation, which was the president's campaign, that a few guys sat down together and women and said, you know, why don't we get together with the Russians? They might have a way to elect Trump president. Uh, would they do that on their own to do such a bizarre thing to meet with an enemy of the United States to get their boss uh, elected without telling the boss about it? Um, believe me, if uh, serious people, high ranking people in the campaign colluded with the Russians, there'll be a trail back to the president. Tolu, a lot of times we hear these comments from Giuliani and think of them as gaffes, but sometimes they end up being purposeful, like he's trying to get ahead of some major story that's about to drop. Do you think that's the case here? 
Uh, it, it, it's difficult to know the strategy uh, Rudy Giuliani is implementing here. He has been sort of all over the place. He has sort of put things out that have been smoke screens and have caused uh, the public to sort of scratch their heads about where things are going next. And I think he's served a, a sort of a distraction role in, in making people leave the trail from the president and, and focus on the, the bizarre things that his lawyer is saying. So it's not clear whether or not Mr. Giuliani is trying to get ahead of something. His moving up the goalposts and talking about, you know, collusion may have happened, but it didn't happen with the president is uh, maybe a sign that he knows something that the rest, the rest of us don't about what Mueller knows. We do know that Giuliani and the president's other lawyers have been in constant contact with the Mueller team, so maybe uh, that's a sign that we're, of where things are going and what the public may soon know about the collusion question and whether or not people around the president and his inner circle were involved in uh, discussions with the Russians and uh, trading of information with the Russians. We already do know that President Trump's uh, campaign manager, Paul Manafort, was sharing polling data with uh, Russian operatives. So maybe that is a sign that we're getting closer to collusion, but Giuliani is trying to draw a bright red line between people on the campaign and the president himself to protect the president from uh, Mueller's probe into collusion and maybe throw under the bus some of the president's close hmm. advisors and uh, close confidants. Tolu Olaranifa, Paul Cowan, good to have both of you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, one month of no pay. The government shutdown inflicting financial pain on the very people who defend this nation. Keep us safe. So what are the potential security risks? I'll ask former Secretary of Homeland Security Jay Johnson what keeps him up at night. I want to show you this. TSA workers at the busiest airport on the planet, Atlanta, getting donated food from a group that typically serves homeless people. These are the people we depend on to find explosives in luggage, having to fall back on handouts just to feed their families. The shutdown is inflicting financial pain on TSA employees, on Border Patrol agents, Coast Guard personnel, Secret Service agents, the very people we rely on to keep our nation safe. And joining me now, former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson, who served during President Obama's second term. And Secretary Johnson, you're the perfect person to have with us today as we now are entering the 30th day of this government shutdown. You obviously have had um, a unique position in the government and have access to information and understanding of, of some of the things that we don't know about when it comes to national security. What keeps you up at night? Right now, what keeps me up at night is the emerging security crisis we're having because really a self-inflicted wound, which is the very people we depend on to keep us safe. You know, separate and apart from any discussion about a border wall, about border security, the very people we depend on, and we depend on the people most, more than anything else, to keep us safe, land, sea, air, TSA, Coast Guard, Border Patrol, Customs, cybersecurity personnel, the Secret Service, our people, because of the failure of our political leadership, are the people that we are inflicting all sorts of stress, anxiety, and anger in their personal lives and in the lives of their family. And having led this very large workforce for three years through some periods of near government shutdowns, I know what that's like. So for example, 2015, uh, when we came close to a shutdown of DHS, there was a woman who worked for TSA, I'll never forget her, she had stage four cancer, and she was dependent upon her salary, her paychecks for her co-pays for her cancer treatment, and we were going to have to furlough her if we went into shutdown, and I took on personally counseling her through the stress of this. Most of our security personnel live paycheck to paycheck, and we're inflicting all this anxiety on them. And as you pointed out in your lead-in, these are the very people we depend on to look for explosives, to look for weapons in luggage for aviation security, for counter drug on the high seas. And if their mind's somewhere else. And if their mind is someplace else, if they're distracted, if they're upset, uh, we are compromising our own security. And this is something as a result of our own leaders' failure to come to an agreement. Is there a breaking point? I worry that there will be a breaking point if they miss their next paycheck, frankly. To miss two consecutive paychecks is a big, big deal to ask someone who makes thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. And even if this were resolved tomorrow, the damage we have done to our security and our law enforcement, I think, will last months, if not years, in terms of 
retention, recruitment. People in the Coast Guard, for example, may think twice about re-enlisting. People in the Secret Service will have their families tell them, why do you need to work these long hours and you're not getting paid? And so when I was in office, we were fighting high levels of attrition just in the Secret Service. And we're able to turn that around, but I fear that this will be a major step backwards in so many respects. Just yesterday, the president made a new pitch to the American people and really to lawmakers, Democrats, uh, offering them a cer some concessions, some would say, in exchange for his money for border security, his wall that he's touted. But here are some of his proposals, $800 million for drug detention um, and detection, I should say, technology at ports of entry, thousands more border agents, dozens more immigration judges, and $5.7 billion for new border barriers. He says he's talking about roughly 200 miles, not a wall from sea to shining sea, doesn't have to be built of concrete, could be still slats, among other things. I want your read on this. Are these effective measures for I, I thought that there was a lot to work with in that proposal. Uh, we need more immigration judges. We need more technology at ports of entry where you you find the most dangerous things trying to cross our southern border. And I noted the use of the word barrier as opposed to a wall signaling perhaps some flexibility there. But what strikes me most, if you could remove the emotion and the politics from this, from this dispute, New tonight, we are now hearing from the teenager at the center of this viral video featuring a standoff with a Native American elder at the Lincoln Memorial. The teenager says there's a lot more to this story than what we're seeing in the initial clips. CNN Sarah Seidner has been digging on it for us. Sarah. That's right. We did receive uh, three pages uh, of comments from this young man. Uh, his family sent it out, and here is part of what he says. And, and obviously, with these viral videos, there's a lot more to them. There's always a story that goes along with them that happened before and after something like this happens. And we have viewed video uh, that gives a bitter, better, bigger picture of what happened leading up to uh, that face-off between the student uh, and the Native American elder. Here's what was one of part of the statement from the student who was standing there face to face. He said, because we were being loudly attacked and taunted in public, a student in our group asked one of our teacher chaperones for permission to begin our school spirit chants to counter the hateful things that were being shouted at our group. Our chaperone gave us permission to use our school chants. Now, he is referring to the nasty things they were hearing, not from the Native American group, but from a group of black men who call themselves the Hebrew Israelites. And we are now going to show you some video of exactly some of the things that they were saying to the students and others. New video emerges in a story that has gone viral between Catholic school students and a Native American elder named Nathaniel Phillips. Phillips found himself surrounded by students, one staring him down, the others chanting around him. As Phillips says, he was trying to create calm between two groups at odds. I, I realized I had put myself in a really dangerous situation, you know. It was like, here's a group of people who were angry at somebody else, and I put myself in front of that, and all of a sudden, I'm the one who's all that anger and all that wanting to have the freedom to just rip me apart. This video shows what happened long before Phillips shows up. You can see a group of about five black men who identify as Hebrew Israelites preaching. They start taunting people of all colors, other black visitors, natives, and a Catholic priest. That makes America great again. A bunch of child molested this is the moment that group becomes aware of the students, some wearing Make America Great Again hats. And you got these pompous bastards come down here in, in the middle of a, a native rally with their dirty ass hat on. At first, the Catholic school students are there in small numbers, but more and more students begin to gather, watching, with few weighing in. The small group of men continues taunting them. A bunch of in incest babies, right, trailer park babies. This is what America makes, make America great looks like. The students begin to react, but do not approach the men. The black Israelites continue to condemn the kids. You worship blasphemy. We got angels that are blasphemy. Then one of the students takes off his shirt and the group begins chanting. Two minutes later, you hear a drumbeat. 
That is Phillips and another Native American drummer. He says it was an attempt to thwart potential violence. The kids dance to it and some begin chanting along with the Native song. But for those who think they were enjoying each other's company, Phillips says that is not at all how it felt, especially because of the student standing before him. Fear, not for myself, but fear for the next generation, fear where this country's going, fear for those youths, fear for their future, fear for their souls, their spirit, their, their what they're going to do to this country. Now, in the student's statement, he says that he is now facing fear, that he is receiving death threats, as is his family, and he talks a little bit more about what happened during that interaction, saying that he never interacted with the protester, that he did not speak to him. He says, I did not make any hand gestures or other aggressive moves. To be honest, I was startled and confused as to why he had approached me. I believe that remaining motionless and calm, I was helping to defuse the situation. And he goes on to say, I harbor no ill will for this person. I respect this person's right to protest and engage in free speech activities. And I support his chanting on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial any day of the week. I believe, though, he should rethink his tactics of invading the personal space of others. But that is his choice to make. So you are now hearing the other side of this story. You're hearing from the student who has been at the center of all this, saying that from his perspective, he was the one being calm and he was the one that was getting the aggressive threats. Uh, of course, you also heard from the Native American elder who said he was actually trying to calm the situation down too. The people who seem to have started all of this are the ones making all those racist threats uh, and screaming at these kids, and those were the Hebrew Israelites. Anna? All right, Sarah Seidner, thanks for digging deep. We appreciate you staying on top of this. He has been a rumored presidential candidate for years, but is the billionaire former head of Starbucks finally getting close to making it official? We have new reporting on Howard Schultz next. When I tell people my story, they don't believe it, but it's true. I've always thought, what would it be like if you turned the corner one day and you saw yourself? Oh my God. Wow. The first time the boys met the three together, it was a miracle. There was nothing that could keep us apart. That's when things kind of got funky. Something was just not right. I'd like to know the truth. There was always a question mark. The parents had never been told. They're trying to conceal what they did from the people they did it to. There's still so much that we don't know. How could you not tell us? Three identical strangers next Sunday at night. Stop me if this sounds familiar. Billionaire, businessman, thinking about a presidential bid, as identified as a Democrat, but may not run as one. Sources tell CNN former Starbucks CEO and vocal Trump critic Howard Schultz is exploring a possible independent bid for the presidency in 2020. Now, over the years, CNN's Poppy Harlow has asked Schultz many, many times if he was interested in running. Here's what he has said in the past. Will you rule out a run for political office? Yes, I will rule out. I have no interest in a political office. I'm here at Starbucks. Do you think you'll run for office, any sort of office, in 2016? Oh, you know, I'm just thinking, has there been an interview that you and I have done where you have not asked me that question? No. Uh, no, I have no plans to run for office. Are you considering at all a run for the White House? I have no plans whatsoever to run for political office. Are you considering at all throwing your hat in the ring for 2020? Uh, you know, you've, I don't know how many times you've asked me this question. And each time I've had a pretty consistent answer. And certainly, I am deeply committed to all things Starbucks at this time. It's not a never. <laughs> and he's not at Starbucks anymore. Joining us now, CNN politics and business correspondent Christina Aleshi. So, uh, Christina, interesting to take that walk down memory lane because more recently there have been some signs that Schultz was at least softening his position on whether to run. What more can you tell us? Well, he's definitely been coy about the question in recent interviews, and we have to remember that 
Look, Schultz has been more willing than most CEOs I've interviewed to weigh in on politics. For, for years now, he's been doing this. Now, in recent years, he seems to be taking an even harder stance in politics. In 2017, when the Trump administration announced an executive order, for example, uh, that was, con uh, was considered a Muslim ban, banning refugees from majority Muslim countries, Starbucks announced that it would hire 10,000 refugees uh, over five years. That was two days after the Trump administration made that announcement. He's also said that Trump has caused chaos that could hurt the economy, and he's criticized uh, the president's tax policy. All this has culminated right now into his book tour next week. He's kicking it off, and what I'm hearing from sources is that he's going to make statements at these individual stops that will continue to stoke speculation about his presidential run. But boy, it was poppy persistent in all those interviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a dogged reporter. Um, why an independent, though, if he does make this run? D does that set off any potential alar alarm bells for Democrats who would be looking to defeat Trump? It's a good question. It's a big issue for him. You know, independent is an interesting choice for Howard. He definitely has a progressive streak if you look at the way he's run his company. But he also said things, has said things in the past that more aligned with Republicans. He's talked about runaway government spending. He's talked about changes to entitlements. Uh, the reason that independent might be appealing to him is because his strategists are probably suggesting that that's a path to victory, that both sides have been so polarized and that there's a swath of people in the middle of America that doesn't want to rep uh, vote Republican or Democrat because they're just sick of the partisan politics. The problem is no one knows how big that pool of people is right now and the Democrats rightly fear that an independent candidate can drain votes from them and hand the election victory to Trump and the Washington the chair of Washington's Democratic Party Washington State has been fiercely opposed to um, Howard Schultz running as an independent in fact just tonight she's issuing an invitation to Howard to meet with her saying you know I haven't heard from you about your possible independent presidential bid but I want to meet and talk about this so put you know all the party side of, the, uh, of, of this discussion aside for a moment because when you just look at Howard Schultz, the person, and his portfolio, his resume, what advantages or disadvantages might he have in a general election? Well, he has a very compelling story. You know, when, when any reporter sits down and kind of learns about his story, it's remarkable. He grew up in the projects in Canarsie, Brooklyn. He talks about how his father was injured on the job and how he had to witness his father not being able to provide for the family because he didn't have workers' comp um, or insurance or any safety net. And he wanted to build a company uh, that his father would be proud to work for. And that's what inspired a lot of the policies at Starbucks. He's a successful businessman. I think the difficulty that he has is that his name is not well known outside of New York and California, and he's going to have to spend a lot of money, which is another issue for him. He is a billionaire at a time when Democrats are taking shots at billionaires. They, they don't want them to self-fund. Uh, Howard has is worth about $3.3 billion, according to Forbes. That is about 43 billion less than another Democrat who wants to than a, than, a, than another billionaire who wants to run as a Democrat, uh, Michael Bloomberg, who has you know run a huge city and definitely has is making you know stoking speculation about mm -hmm. a potential bid there. I know you are following his potential candidacy as well, Christina Aleshi. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right. Back.